Okay, greetings uh, from Arizona uh, and wherever uh, you are on the other line. I wanted to uh, give you a brief overview of the connection between uh, some of the academic work going on in systems engineering and, and then the product that you're going to hear about today, SEER SIS. Uh, the story really goes back about 15 years ago uh, when I was a graduate student at the University of Southern California. Uh, that's also where uh, the Galarath headquarters are in Los Angeles and there's been a lot of collaboration between those two groups on developing cost models. And at the time, we were trying to figure out uh, how to best develop a cost model specifically for systems engineering. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and the product that was uh, created from that collaboration and what's happened in the last 15 years to get us to today in terms of what you're going to see as something that's uh, commercially validated and, and, be, and being ruled out. So the first thing that I wanted to point you to in the presentation is the connection between the phase of the life cycle and the impact that something has on the cost. Uh, so this is a graphic uh, that was developed by Sandia National Labs, which I think really clearly illustrates uh, in a visual way, uh, as you move from left to right, the proportional size of these elements uh, is representative of its cost. But what's important is the length of the shadow. And that's essentially what we're talking about today is at the beginning when you're defining requirements or you're trying to trade between different solutions, uh, you're making a huge impact and you're making very important decisions. And that's why the shade, the shadow is, is very long. And, and this is essentially when you would use a cost model uh, to help support some of these decisions. So excellent graphic to communicate uh, that standpoint. But you know, digging a little deeper, um, when you look at what systems engineers do, there are a variety of industry standards out there. And this one, I think, uh, illustrates, uh, is pretty comprehensive because it illustrates almost everything that systems engineers do uh, from the standpoint of the EIA 632 uh, system engineering standard. So the, the time dimension is uh, from the bottom of the slide to the right side uh, in terms of the phases of the project, starting with requirements and moving on to implementation and operations. And then the processes that most people are familiar with are along the, the top, starting with the actual analysis that system engineers do, synthesis, functional allocation, et cetera. But then there are the functions uh, which are along the vertical axis on the left which talk about all the different pieces of the organization that systems engineers touch. So when you look at this in, in terms of three dimensions, there's potentially a lot out there uh, that isn't necessarily being captured by other cost models. So that's an important note to make because there are some very good cost models out there that cover software or hardware or manufacturing or information technology. And, and some of those cover some systems engineering functions, but but there's a risk that systems engineers, system engineering functions would be missed uh, unless there was an explicit cost model to address that. So that's, that's really the focus of today. Um, looking at systems engineering in terms of its role in uh, famous failures on projects, uh, I think uh, a lot of these are arguable, but I think it's a really good perspective in terms of why projects failed. And it, it isn't always necessarily because the technology was mediocre or or it didn't pan out, uh, a lot of times it's because of communication or configuration management or not considering issues like scalability uh, or, or just human, uh, human dynamics that aren't necessarily predictable uh, in the traditional engineering discipline. So this just re reiterates the fact that you have to get systems engineering right uh, in, in order to have a successful program. So where all this uh, leads us is, well, if we know uh, why projects fail, then why do they continue to fail? Or what can we do uh, to make these uh, higher probability of success? So there's a, there's a long list. This, this is not comprehensive, but it, it touches upon some of the root causes, which is looking at requirements, uh, communicating among stakeholders, understanding the complexity of these requirements, and, and having a way to model it and plugging into this 
model-based system engineering initiative that's taking place in the in the community uh, that involves not just design and trade studies but also cost as part of that relationship. Um, so all of this work kind of led us to uh, developing the constructive systems engineering cost model known as COSISMO, which again was an academic effort but supported uh, very strongly by Gallarath and other partners in the uh, aerospace and defense industry, which led us to this point of modeling systems engineering through size drivers and effort multipliers. And in, in the lingo, sometimes effort multipliers are referred to as cost drivers as well. Um, but this was essentially version one of the model, where uh, we found that the greatest predictors of systems engineering effort were things like the number of requirements, the number of interfaces, the number of operational scenarios, and the number of algorithms in a system. And the assumption was that these could be counted at the beginning of a project. And, and if you had an accurate representation of the size of the uh, system, of the requirements and the interfaces, et cetera, you would have then a very good prediction of the amount of system engineering hours or person months that were needed to uh, uh, to have a successful project. Now, the, the calibration that's uh, shown here on the bottom of the green box uh, that is representative of the cost model, the calibration is important because this is something that is not just specific to an industry, but it's also specific to uh, a particular company or a product line within a company. Uh, so this is where uh, the commercial tools like SEER really um, help you do the customization that's necessary to make a cost model relevant to a particular case or to a particular product line. Um, I want to talk, just make one more remark about the effort multipliers, which are the, uh, the orange uh, letters, the, the orange font on the bottom of the slide. Uh, because they really carry a lot of the detail that goes behind why a system or, or why a project requires a certain amount of system engineering effort. In some cases, some projects require a whole lot, and, and, and part of the explanation is because of these effort multipliers. And so they are categorized into five buckets. How well the system is understood is the first bucket. Uh, how complex the project or the system is is the second bucket. Um, how sophisticated does the uh, operation have to be uh, of the system is the third bucket. The fourth one is uh, how experienced are the people working on it. And then the fifth is the, uh, how, how mature is the development environment uh, that this is uh, being developed under. So generally speaking, if these five categories of system characteristics are well understood and, and there is a a stable understanding of, of uh, the impact of these things on cost, then that's where the model comes in and you can start making some uh, initial decisions and initial representation of uh, the impact of these things on systems engineering effort. Now, what we've also found is that understanding uh, the things on this slide also tell you a lot about the system in general. Uh, so it's not necessarily restricted to estimating effort for systems engineering, but it's also understanding uh, the probability of the success of the project. Uh, so there's a really good relationship between uh, understanding uh, the project as a whole and understanding the specific system engineering effort that's needed to be successful. So those, those are uh, the remarks that I want to make in terms of teeing up what Jason King's father is going to show you because it helps you understand some of the background of how we got to today based on some of the academic research taking place uh, at the University of Southern California and now uh, University of Arizona. So what I'm going to do is uh, hand control over to Jason and he will drive it from here. All right. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, how to use an S, uh, use SEER for systems engineering to uh, quickly build an estimate. 
um, a little bit about SEER for Systems Engineering, or SEER SIS for shorthand. It is Galarath's software tool that leverages Dr. Valerity's research and Galarath's data, and it has been validated by our industry champions for uh, more than three years now. Uh, and this has allowed us to develop knowledge bases for different domains and system levels uh, to improve the estimating process. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to show how SEER is uh, good for your systems engineering organization uh, because it requires, or sorry, because it rapidly estimates systems engineering effort and budget. And it does this using systems engineering work products, like the requirement spec or the CONOPS document. And it gives you insight by department and activity, unlike the previous model, like the tax, the system tax model, which only gave one number for systems engineering effort. And then it also allows quick evaluation of different approaches, like if you want to compare adapting a legacy system versus starting with an entirely new uh, system from scratch. SEER for Systems Engineering is also a good tool for management uh, because it is quantifiable, it is consistent, and it allows you to build uh, best practice estimating processes around this tool. Uh, it also gives management insight into risks and opportunities, and I'll show a little bit about more about that in the demo. So when you're estimating with SEER, uh, the estimate is, is fairly easy. You start by describing the system at a high level using our knowledge bases. And these set the parameters like the effort multipliers to validated ranges. So you can move quickly to sizing your system. Uh, and you do this using your systems engineering work products that uh, Dr. Valerity discussed earlier and expert judgment. And that's it. You have your estimate. Now you can use it to perform trade-off analysis, or you can incorporate it into your proposal. For our demonstration, we're going to use the following scenario, that uh, the customer has emailed us a list of 1,000 new requirements, two new interfaces, and one new operational scenario. Uh, they want uh, Your management wants a not-to-exceed system engineering estimate. Uh, by tomorrow. Uh, you know this is uh, part of an existing system that you are already providing to this customer, and you know that you have lost two experienced people in your group out of 20 due to requirements. So given this information, we can go into the tool, identify our key parameters from what we know, and build our estimate. This is the SEER for Systems Engineering user interface. For those of you who are unfamiliar with SEER, at the top we have our menu bar and our toolbar that provide icons for uh, many commonly used features. On the left is the WBS where we will be building our estimate. On the right, at the top, are the parameters where you enter all of your estimating parameters for each work element. Bottom left is the reports available. There are several, several reports available in CR for Systems Engineering. And the bottom right is where you can see your charts, which are quick graphical views. So we are going to start a new architecture design work element. This is the workhorse of SEER for systems engineering. Uh, so we know that this is a missile seeker. So it's unmanned air. Uh, it's uh, called a new function. So that equivalent is equivalent to a minor subsystem. It's, it's not a full major subsystem like guidance. Uh, the application is military because it's a missile. Acquisition. 
We know it is a new standalone function, so I'm going to choose new development, and I'm going to choose some economic factors with some default labor rates. So now that I've set the knowledge bases, I can move into sizing my system. So CR for Systems Engineering uh, partitions all of the sizing factors, requirements, interfaces, algorithms, and operational scenarios by whether they are easy, nominal, and difficult. And then you can also select a level of reuse, everything from a brand new system requirement to an adopted system requirement that you are just passing forward from a legacy system. So we know these are new system requirements, and we know we have a thousand new requirements. So now, one thing you can see now is that the estimate is changing real time down in the bottom left-hand corner as I make these changes. So now we know we have interfaces as well. We said two new interfaces. And if you are starting from a new system, you would count requirements from, for example, the number of shells and wills in your requirements spec. You count interfaces from your by counting all of the connections in your interface control report. Uh, we don't have any algorithms in this particular scenario, but we do have one operational scenario. So now we have four categories of effort multipliers. Uh, we separate them slightly different than Dr. Valerdi did, but they're basically the same. Uh, they're basically the same uh, effort multipliers. So we know this is an ex existing system, so we have a very mature architecture. I am going to turn that up. And you can see that that actually did had a fair reduction on my estimate. And if you want to see how sensitive, oops, if you want to see how sensitive <clears throat> the estimate is to any one parameter, you can choose the sensitivity report. And now we can see that the architecture understanding, uh, it, is, it is, has a fairly high impact when you change, change it to very high. Uh, the other thing we know is that we have uh, lost some people. And we can see turnover 2 out of 20 is about 20 percent. So I am going to set this to nominal low. That is going to drive up our estimate a little. And then we know we have a not to exceed. And for our purposes, we'll say that we want to set the point estimate at 80 percent. And so that's it. Now we have our estimate uh, given what we know in a few minutes, and we can look at how to use this information. Uh, we have the quick estimate report here. It is your top line estimate, uh, 124,000 hours. Uh, given an average, industry average labor rates, it's about an $18 million systems engineering effort. You can look at risk. So you can see that our 80% estimate here is 124,000 hours. But really, the range could be anywhere from 48,000 to 188,000 hours. And then we can also look at how these 124,000 hours are broken up uh, based on the ANSI 632 activities. 
Uh, we can see about 38,000 hours in technical evaluation, 37,000 hours in design. Uh, we can also look at how this is divided up between our labor categories, between your our management, our systems analyst, and our systems architect, which is right now taking the, the lion's share of the effort. So going back, we need to understand also what this 124,000 hour estimate covers. Uh, in the terms of ISO 15288, it includes the development phases. So conceptualize, develop, OTNE, and then transition to operation. It does not include production or retirement phases. Uh, so that's really important to keep in mind. As far as activities, it includes all of the ANSI 632 systems engineering activities. Uh, of course, in these five categories, which the, uh, the spec divides into 33 tasks, if you ever need a specific, is this included or is this not? And then using later ca labor category categories, you can set labor rates using our built-in categories or map labor and rates to 11 customizable labor categories and every labor category can be divided between 100 and 0% in-house labor or contractor labor, each with a different rate. And so that is how you get a systems engineering estimate using SEER for Systems Engineering.